Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Joe Eggers. I'm the interim director for the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And before we get started today, I want to thank today's co-sponsors, the Department for American Indian Studies and the Institute for Advanced Study here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Gabrielle spears Rico, uh, professor uh, in American Indian Studies and Chicano and Latino Studies. And Gabriela is also a member of the center's advisory board and has been working with us for several years in organizing panels and events uh, that mark Indigenous Peoples Week as our center recognizes the genocide of Indigenous peoples both here and across uh, the United States and North America, South America. Um, Gabriela, I will turn you over to you. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you so much, Joe, for all of the logistical support and the overall support that we have received from the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies to be able to put on this um, event, which I'm very excited about today. Um, this is an event titled Dancing with Life, Living Culture and Resistance Among Indigenous Communities in Michoacan. And it is also a celebration of our book, which I'm going to hold up and show everybody here this beautiful book <laughs> that the lighting is not great in my office, but um, I encourage you to pick it up. It's University of Texas Press um, 2023. So it's fresh out of the oven. And I'm so excited to once again be in dialogue with my colleagues um, in Purepecha Studies and in Indigenous Michoacan Studies today. Um, some amazing um, figures within that field that um, that thankfully, you know, agreed to be part of this panel and to showcase um, their work as is related to the book and or as is featured in the book today. So first, I would like to welcome Dr. Pavel Schlossberg who is actually the, um, the author and also editor of um, this particular book. Dr. Pav Pavel Schlossberg completed his PhD in the Doctoral Communications Program at Columbia University in New York City, and is the author of Crafting Identity, Transnational Indian Arts, and the Politics of Race in Central Mexico. That's University of Arizona Press 2015. Currently, he serves as the Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs and as an Associate Professor of Communication and Leadership Studies at Gonzaga University. Prior to his appointment at Gonzaga, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of New Mexico and a lecturer at the University of Virginia. Dr. Schlossberg is a co-developer of the Global Leadership Concentration at Gonzaga. His intercultural work examines how leaders and communicators might effectively understand and navigate local and global barriers to equity and inclusion. Most recently, he is the author and editor of Dancing with Life, Recontextualizing Mexican Masks, and curator of the book's accompanying exhibit at the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture in Spokane, which happened um, earlier uh, this year in 2023. So welcome, um, Pavel, as I know him, Dr. Schlossberg, and uh, please uh, uh, you know, move on to your presentation, which is titled Dancing with Life, Recontextualizing Mexican Masks and Danzas. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gabby, for this uh, warm introduction and for arranging this panel. I want to actually start with a very quick land acknowledgement. I'm presenting from Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, and Gonzaga resides both on the ancestral and contemporary homelands of the Spokane tribe of Indians. Um, and, and obviously, I want to, again, uh, underscore this gratitude to Gabby and Dr. Gabriela Spears Rico. Uh, American Indian Studies, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the Institute for Advanced Studies, and of course, as warmly to my collaborators and uh, co-panelists in this work and this project, Dr. Mincy and Martinez Rivera, Dr. Luis Orieta, and doctoral candidate Mario Gomez Zamora. It, it is such an honor and pleasure to be here in, in, in this conversation with you. And without further ado, I'll jump, uh, in the interest of time, I will jump right in uh, and I will share the, the screen right now, you should be able to see it, hopefully. Okay, so just I'll give a little bit of a framework uh, for uh, the, the project. And again, it's one perspective and you will have a range of relevant and, and pro probably more important perspectives th than mine, but I'll, I'll share mine for it, my own context for th this work. 
Uh, it is a collaboration with the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture, also University of Texas Press with the catalog and, and the exhibit. Uh, and, and, and for me, among other things, it was an opportunity to continue and extend the work in crafting identity, which looked at indigenous arts and culture, specifically in Michoacan, Purepecha communities. And the focus there has been around symbolic violence constructed across borders, especially in, in symbolic work, in, in representations of patrimony heritage. Um, so things such as exhibits, tiangas, catalogs, other medias, and looking at it specifically through the experience of indigenous mask artists in Michoacan, specifically in the community of Tokoro, but more broadly in that region. region. And the goal of the, this work uh, is kind of tee up and, and, be, and be part of that conversation in terms of making visible, addressing and creating space to push back on some of the symbolic violence that continues to exist vis-a-vis -vis, uh, indigenous, specifically Kurepecha communities in, in Michoacan, but obviously beyond that as well. Um, and and one, one of the outcomes of that was, you know, looking critically at some of the museum practices, some of the catalogs, not just in terms of representation, but how those things are literally impacting uh, actual artists who are working within uh, forms of symbolic uh, and, and practical and material violence as well. Um, and, and so, um, you know, a, a chance, you know, so there was a, you know, a, a critique there and the Dancing with Life, uh, you know, seeks to um, really look at, uh, you know, some of the these exhibits and do something different, push back against uh, so, some of the frameworks that are used, we'll go into it in a moment, but, uh, you know, which often emphasize, among other things, and magnify supernatural and otherworldly matters related with the danzas, which are a, a local form of community expression, but they often typically de-emphasize, edit out, and ignore practical, concrete, contemporary, social, material, and political issues and, and matters as well. And, and there are some real impacts, and I think in their own way, uh, many, if not all, of the panelists will also address some of the, the, the significance of that, and, and I and I will do that in, in, in a way as well. So I want to situate myself as I move now from there into uh, dancing with life and from a little bit of the context. It's important for me to situate myself. I'm uh, in the context of the work in, in Michoacan, uh, in Tokoro, in the area. You know, I, I guess I would characterize myself as a guest, a friend, a student, an ethnographer, a participant, action collaborator, really now over the period of 20 years in Tokoro and in the surrounding communities. You know, the goal with Dancing with Life specifically has been to kind of rebalance and re reframe how the dances and masks are depicted. They are so important to identity expression uh, and, and so many other things in, in, in the local communities. And this is what we, we call in. Latin American studies, among other areas, uh, Diologo de Saberes, uh, approach to center, uh, which allow us to center the voices of artists and dancers and other in the, in the community that really haven't had enough uh, of those voices centered in a lot of the received uh, representations, exhibits, catalogs, um, and, you know, the issues and topics that both really in, in crafting identity and then in a different way in dancing of life you know, have really been developed by this collaborative and participatory process of action research in communities and equally importantly in collaboration with scholars with roots in the Puri and Perinda community context. Those are some of my esteemed co-panelists, obviously. Um, so that's a little bit. So now I'm going to jump a little bit more into the actual content. Um, and I want to kind of center it and very much kind of be a little bit of the ethnographer that I am in which I base the work and talk a little bit about uh, one of the specific dances in Tokoro, the Pastorella, which depicts the journey of the shepherds to the manger of Bethlehem to honor and be blessed by the baby Jesus. It's a, it's a common story, not just in Tokoro, obviously, but told in different ways around Michoacan, Guanajuato, some of the other towns and, 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 and communities also outside of, uh, you know, obviously th that region of Mexico uh, as well. And those pastorellas, like other dances, are masquerades. And some of the performers, they put on masks, many locally carved to represent and do a take on the personalities of various characters in the drama. Uh, so here are some, some images from some conventional parts of the story, what often received catalogs have emphasized. So for example, here's an example with Archangel Michael uh, defeating the, the, three, the three devils. This is on in the basketball court in, in, in Tokoro uh, taken some years ago. 
That's the image on the left. The image on the right are, are the shepherds who are there to ask for the blessing and be sort of redeemed and saved by the baby uh, Jesus. And and uh, the, the various roots, I mean, I'm not going to go into all of it right here. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a complex story with a lot of different roots. One of the, some of the aspects we're centrally seeing right here are, are, are the context of, of, of the Christian Catholic story that, that came through with evangelization. There are other We'll talk about some of the other aspects of, of the story and how it gets reworked and, and, and other things that happen in it. Um, if this was in a, a different type of interactive session, this was the moment I would ask, like, who, do you know who this is? And this is, um, I, you know, I've, I've been in the community uh, very recently for Dancing with Life, but this is from the previous generation. This is when I was doing Crafting Identity. It's such a great image because this is actually uh, Presidente Fox at that point in, in, in Mexico. And George W. Bush, and they are coming, and, and they are these uh, characters that are also in, in the drama. So right now, you it, it, you know, you, you literally immediately get the point that hey, there is social and political contemporary commentary that is interwoven in in, in this in this cosmic drama of good and bad and evil, virtue and vice, it, it very much located in the community, and uh, that's just a really important point to keep in mind because these are very contemporary dances. And, and dramas and, and con community conversations that are engaging with local social, political, economic issues. Uh, and, and that's literally being depicted and represented in the dances and, and, and what they do. Um, so now I wanna kind of jump forward a little bit to uh, from a, a more recent moment uh, from February, 2020. This was something that was shared in, 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 in the exhibit and, and in the catalog. And it was a dance from uh, it, it's done annually. It starts on February 2nd every year. This is February 2nd, 2020. Um, and this was something that was shared by one of uh, my friends and one of the mask artists. I work with Felipe Orr on his Facebook feed on February 3rd. And and then when I was doing the work around the, the dances and I was asking about, hey, what about some of the contemporary themes that have been relevant recently? This was uh, one of uh, Felipe's grown sons literally tagged me it, it, it you know, shared this directly with me very much with that intention. And that happened in August of 2021. So very recently. And, and this is the, this is moment is important because this is obviously right on the beginning of, of, of the, the COVID pandemic, literally, you know, kind of cresting and impacting the town. And, and so it's being already sort of, there's a lot of anxiety in the air, you know, that was true locally in Tokoro, that was true probably in many parts of the world where we're living in that together, this, this weird, and profound global moment. Um, and uh, so the performers, and, and there are these clowns uh, that, that are that are part of this drama, and they they're, tend to be also not quite the devils, not the shepherds, but, you know, uh, human beings with, with, with their virtues and vices and sins and, uh, and errors in their ways. And, um, and, and in this case, these, these tricksters, these clowns, they were doctors, they were EMTs, they were the medical industry, um, and, you know, and who are being de depicted in this way. And, and again, you know, so, some of these, these tricksters are, they're also false idols. They're compromised figures who also kind of waylay, mislead, and, and seek to corrupt the shepherd, the, the pastores, the shepherds. So it's very much, it's very interesting that, you know, very much is direct engagement with like a big issue of the moment, the pandemic, but also how, how is the medical sector, you know, responding? Are we safe? Are we not? Uh, what, what's going on? And so really this moment, the, those images, they really show how the pastorella, you know, uh, it, it takes on different themes, but can depict, frame, and manage through drama and humor, happiness and sadness, celebratory and threatening happiness that the community faces. And so in the, in the recorded scene, that I have actually have the video for it. So in the guise of buffoonish doctors, nurses, medical orderlies, you know, these masks, the Dan Dansantes, they're lampooning, they're satirizing, they're jousting with the approaching coronavirus. But they're also thinking and asking interesting questions about the medical personnel. Um, is this threat, you know, and what's going on? Is the threat attributed to this pandemic real or over, in a very prescient way, too? Is this, you know, pandemic real or overblown? Will, uh, will medicine be capable or really clownishly incapable of meeting this threat? Is the local and regional and I would also say underfunded and limited system of medical care able to handle this health threat. Um, and all of this is happening in the dances. And uh, this is one, one example, but I wanted to, to give a counterpoint to, to 
from move now from the way that the, my lo, my lo, my friends my local you would say the not my if not with my the local in, informants presented this work what they shared with me what was relevant what was important to the way uh, in in a, in a more in, in a broader way um, uh, some some scholars in, in in Mexico and then through NPR presented in Mexico City then presented. Uh, how local indigenous communities were dealing with the mar uh, with, with, with the virus through the dances, which are much more repetitive of the dominant patterns, and then I'll very briefly touch on the stakes there. So August 2021, reporter Kathy Newman uh, posted a photograph, a, a journalistic story, Mexican masks, uh, portray COVID as tiger, devil, blue-eyed man, and then Newman's account incorporates an interview with Blanca Cárdenas and Carlos Davila, they're scholars and students in ethnology in Mexico City, and, and, and uh, they commissioned uh, indigenous artisans from all over Mexico to portray the coronavirus through the lens of their uh, through their cultural traditions. And then they did an exhibit uh, collecting these different representations. And what was very interesting and very typical and characteristic, actually, this is what you would from um, from knowing how these conversations have unfolded in dominant discourses in Mexico and beyond, you could predict this actually, is that Cardenas and Davila emphasizes that their exhibit, it <clears throat> spotlights how concepts of the supernatural inform indigenous understandings of the world in response to threats such as a pandemic. Um, both the NPR story then and the Anna exhibit follow the convention of emphasizing and magnifying that supernatural and otherworldly matter that with which the dancers do engage in, in, in different ways. But what is significant here, and this is very typical and routine, they systematically de-emphasize, de, de they ignore, they avoid very practical and current social material, the political issues and matters that are also being addressed in, in the dances, that, that, that social, political, critical voice of the local communities that have been historically and contemporaneously marginalized. So you, you're, you're you're making something really significant and, and a certain form of, with the acknowledgement of a certain form of editing, mediation, I would say symbolic violence is happening there when you're cutting out that critical social contemporary political voice and reproducing a, a set of tropes and stereotypes that cast indigenous knowledge or wisdom into something that is mythical, that is in the path, that has only to do with, 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 with spiritual traditions. Um, you know, so, you know, and, and this is very typical of, of how a lot of this work proceeds and, and the intervention with my uh, wonderful panelists here is like we, we open up the space, we want to disrupt those types of paradigms. And not to say that, that religion and spirituality and indigenous traditions aren't happening, they are, but that's also infused in profound ways with, with contemporary social, political, material critiques, um, that contemporaneous come temporaneity, that coevalness that is being often denied in, 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 the, re in, in the reproduction, the reframing of, of the images. And so, and the exhibits and the dances and the voices. So dance, so Dancing with Life, the exhibit and the catalog, it seeks to kind of question and reframe uh, the, these, these, these narratives, these frameworks. It, it, seems, it, it seeks to align better with the dancer's own folk, which fully engages with this world of the contemporary social, political, material world and, and, and its troubles and, and sometimes its, its joys, as well as the realm of the religious and, and, and the spiritual. So, so that, that is the major intervention with Dancing with Life to help open up that space, not the only place that, uh, that, that's doing it, but, but certainly it hopes to be one of the active places vis-a-vis -vis dancers and masking practices and performance to to, to be doing this work, which is very needed. Um, just very, uh, 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 like 20 seconds left. So I, um, you know, I, I will just very quickly say that, you know, the exhibits and, and catalog, they're important spaces of, of, of breaking down some of the paradigms and fighting what you could say but in the form of symbolic violence, the received forms of colonization that exists and coloniality that exists in, in academia and doing this and that aesthetic realm. And, 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 and academic realm at the same time is really important. These are important spaces of contestation. A lot more to say, but I pass along the, the word palabra now to, to my dear colleagues. Thank you so much, Pavel. And I'll stop sharing. <laughs>
I like starting with your presentation because it helps us um, contextualize the project as a whole. And now we have Dr. Mincy Awanda Martinez Rivera, who is an assistant professor of English, folklore, and Latinx studies at Ohio State University. She has a dual PhD in folklore and anthropology from Indiana University, Bloomington. She has published on the indigenous rock movement in Mexico, Mexico on Purepecha vernacular cultural practices, on conducting research in conflict zones, and decolonizing research methodologies. In June of 2021, her co-edited book with Dr. Solimar Otero, Theorizing Folklore from the Margins, Critical and Ethical Approaches, which was published by Indiana University Press. And in 2022, her co-edited special issue, Redirecting Currents, Theoretical Wayfinding with Latinx Folklorists and Women of Color Transnational Feminisms, was published in the Journal of American Folklore. She is currently editing her book manuscript, tentatively titled Creating Culture, Performing Community, and Angawan Wedding Story, which I'm really excited about. She is currently a member of the Executive Board of the American Folklore Society. In 2021, she was awarded a Career Enhancement Fellowship for junior faculty from the Institute for Scholars and Citizens. Since 2021, she has worked with the Social Justice Collaborative, a nonprofit organization in California that provides legal aid on asylum cases. And prior to joining OSU, she was an assistant professor of anthropology at Providence College. So I welcome Dr. Mant Martinez Rivera, whose presentation is titled Following the Curpiticha Trail. Thank you so much for that amazing, beautiful introduction. So let me uh, share my slides too. Um, and, you know, you know, echoing a little bit in terms of what Pavel was saying, I want to start by especially thanking you, uh, dear Gabriela, Dr. Gabriela Spears Rico, uh, Gavi, and for the invitation. It's always a pleasure and a treat to be among friends and, and you know, that it gets to the point that, you know, colleagues, friends that become family. Uh, so it's always a, a beautiful, you know, um, opportunity to be with all of you, despite the fact that we're so spread out. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Joe, the interim director of the Holocaust and Genocide Studies, for his patience and his help helping, you know, organize and and again for his warm welcome and to having us all of us here today today, uh, today together. Uh, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about my contribution to the book on uh, Dancing with Life that Pavel invited us two three years ago, I think. Uh, at some point at the beginning of the pandemic, and I wanted to share a little bit what is it that I did for the for the paper, but at the same time, how it's departing. And um, and I was telling Dr. Gabriela Spiers Rico before we started the conversation that I changed a little bit my presentation for today, and I'll explain a little bit why. Uh, but my piece for Dancing with Life focuses on the Kurpita tradition and the community of Angawan, which here you see a picture of, of the town, and I'll talk a little bit about, about Angawan in a moment. And in that piece, basically, I talk about the experience of um, spending the time with my host family because that year one of the male um, one of the boys was dancing as a curpite so the piece is very much heavily ethnographic following the whole process the days before leading to um organizing his his attire and then helping him get into into the attire and then following the three days in which the curpites da dance in in angawan in my book uh, that Gabi uh, mentioned, my upcoming book, I do then tie uh, the Kurpita tradition to courtship rituals in the community. Um, and that was originally what I was going to present, but today I wanted to actually take it into another direction that actually ties in with my future research, which is thinking about cultural practices and moments of violence and how people respond culturally when you're having violence, and in this particular case, unfortunately, narco and state violence that has been plaguing the state of Michoacán since 2006. So here it also, and taking into consideration the significance of the 12th of October, right, also in terms of thinking about that today we're talking about living culture and resistance, that's why I wanted and I decided to switch a little bit my presentation. So in talking about how actually some of these dances, right, as Pavel was talking about, normally they are seen or are presented as this mystical 
past removed from the present and like um so that here we actually see and that is actually part of the invitation when Pavel contacted us was to think about how to recontextualize these dances and these masks right in terms of talking about the importance of them living today and for the people today right they're not remnants of the past they're very much alive and they're also being tailored to talk about and reflecting the present, right? And helping the communities and the people in the communities to deal with whatever is happening, being at a pandemic or violence, right? Of, you know, um, state repression and, and narco violence. Um, so that was, you know, why I decided to switch a little bit my presentation for today. So as I was saying, this is Angawan. This is my beautiful, beautiful Angawan. Angawan is a Purepecha community high up in the Sierra in the state of Michoacán. Is actually uh, the highest. Uh, it's almost at 8,000 feet above sea level. Um, and one of the things that is very, people know a lot about Angawan and that, you know, it's very much important. So if you see this image there in the background, there is actually the volcano Paricutin. The Paricutin is the youngest volcano in the world. Um, it was born in 1943. It erupted for 10 years. It stopped uh, in 1953. So Angawan one is one of the communities that was actually, that did not, was not destroyed during the eruptions of the Paricutin and actually became the hub where scientists, politicians, and then anthropologists actually started coming to document the, the, the process or the progress of the volcano as it, you know, formed and destroyed other two towns, Paricutin, where it got its name, the volcano, and another one, San Juan de las Colchas, now called San Juan Parangaricutilimicuaro, or Nuevo San Juan. Um, so Angawan, again, it's, it's, uh, high up. It's, it's incredibly also known in addition to the Paricutin. Uh, also Purepecha is the main language of form of communication. The women, uh, heavily wear and privilege the traditional dress, the vernacular architecture, the trojes. It's very common still in the community. But at the same time, right, you see trocas, right? N returning Norteños bringing trocas, banda, Norteña music, Bad Bunny, although this summer was all about Peso Pluma, right? Peso Pluma all over the place. Um, so in terms of not necessarily this image also of indigenous population, indigenous people, right? Being disconnected from the world and this like very weird. So no, very much connected, very much knowing what is happening uh, in the neighboring communities. So I was mentioning, right, for the piece uh, with, uh, for the, I, went up. So um, in 2009, 2010, I did my year-long dissertation research day in the community. I've gone, I've been going to the community since 2006, always staying with the same family, uh, the Gomez Santa Cruz family, and I lived with them for a year, 2009, 2010, and I've gone um, and, you know, stayed with them multiple times during the summers. Actually went there this summer for San, uh, Santo Santiago with my family. For, and so, you know, we had delicious churi pan corundas. Um, so, but that year, uh, 2010, then I had the, the pleasure of being with them during the Three Kings Day. So in Angawan, the Kurpitans dance on January 6, 7, and 8 for the Three Kings Day, so Epiphany celebrations, right? Uh, the tradition in Angawan actually was brought in by refugees from San Juan and Paricutin, the towns that got destroyed during the eruption of the volcano. So Angawan prior to the destruction of the volcano, they did not dance the curpites. So the young men, actually, these refugees, brought in the tradition of the curpite into Angawan. Um, the other refugees from the community, uh, the destroyed communities, they went and created two other new towns. One is called Calzonsin and now San Nuevo San Juan Parangaricutiro. And they have actually strong fights about who has the most authentic representation of the curpites. Angawan's Kurpites actually transform. It's very, very different from the traditions from San Juan and Calzonsin, which are the ones that are most widely known and that, again, they have like serious fights about their authenticity. The people in Angawan, they're like, we're doing our own thing. This is what we do. This is ours, right? And part of the difference is not only in terms of how they dance it, but also it's actually the whole attire. So here, this is actually one of the my host brothers, Acheo. Well, it was his turn to dance in 2010. Uh, and something that is very characteristic, actually, of the attire is that they have to ask their female friends or, you know, girlfriends or love interests for their mandiles, for the tangariqua. So as you can see here, 
part of the attire is very much as layers and layers of mandiles of the stangariqua uh, that they are put on top of the young person that this young male. Um, so, and they create these layers. So they have to get roughly like 20 different tangariquas. In some cases, they can get them from their siblings, from their sisters. So in these cases, for, for example, the pink one that, that is in the, um, that Cheo is wearing on the left one, that was mine. Uh, so that he has to get, you know, from, again, sisters, relatives, cousin, but it specifically also needs to get from female love interests. Uh, so the male, the attire also, right, they're covered from head to toe, as you can see here. And also the thing is the mask is heavily decorated with ribbons that go all the way back. But one of the things is that the mask is not covering the face. As you can see, it's put on an angle. Uh, so in terms of when they're dancing, they kind of slouch. So then the mask then looks as if it was actually looking at you, but not when they're standing straight. So here, that is one of the ways, right, getting the tangarico is one of the ways in the, which is connected to courtship ritual, right? And, and there's another, which I'll explain in a moment. So as I was saying, the Kurpites and Angawan, they dance on July, uh, July, June 6, 7, and 8. The first one, the first day that they dance is actually as part of the processions for the Three Kings Day Mass. Um, and procession, right? So, so for Epiphany. Uh, Angawan is traditionally uh, divided into two neighborhoods, even though there's actually seven neighborhoods, but for processions, uh, different types of rituals, they're actually divided between two, Barrio de Arriba, Barrio de Abajo. So the neighborhood of the North and neighborhood of the South. Um, so that the curpites that dance, they have to, they organize based on those traditional neighborhoods. The another thing and how it also continues to connect with courtship rituals is that only young single men can dance the curpites. Um, so from very young age until whatever, but they have to be single. They can have a girlfriend, but they cannot be married, right? So they dance the first day and participate as in, in the uh, procession for day of, for, uh, for Three Kings Day, then when they get to the church, they actually dance outside in the atrium. So this is normally the procession is late in the afternoon so that when it's actually then dark, they're getting to the church and then they dance. So here you have also the curpites that are divided between young, so sapichu, curpite sapichu, and then tumbi sapichu, right, uh, sorry, tumbi um uh, curpite or keri curpite, right? So in terms of young and and uh, and older curpites that they dance, other characters that they need to have are the maringuias uh, as well as the viejitos, which I'll mention in a moment. But here, uh, the maringuias are actually dressed as pastorelas, which the pastorelas, and Pavel, we need to talk about this, are very different from the pastorelas that you see in Tocuaro because it's only danced by young women on the 24th, the 25th, and 26th of December. So the pastorelas are actually the opposite or the sibil, sibling uh, tradition of the curpites, but that one, the pastorelas is for young women. Um, so I think it would be interesting to do like a comparison of, of how the pastorelas are done. But in any case, the second day of the curpites, the 7th of January, is the competition. So this is actually a huge, huge event that people come from all neighboring communities to see the dance, the curpite competition in Angawan. And here you also have it divided that you have dances by the Maringuia, which Mario is going to talk a more about the Maringuia, so I will not go into details. You also have the dance of the Viejitos, which is also very, you see the dance of the Viejitos actually represented in also the Lake of Pátzcuaro and other places. Although here the performance of the dance as such is a little bit different of how it's done in the lake. Um, but then you also have a group of characters that they only dance actually in the competition, which are Los Feos. Um, so this is a group of young men that they dance and, you know, they're normally like ugly, dirty, some cases wearing female clothes, but mismatched. So they don't, so, you know, they don't look actually necessarily nice. They're wearing like devil mask or other types of mask. Uh, but, and they, when they're dancing, they're incredibly rowdy. So it's very chaotic, which is the opposite of when the curpitich actually dance which is very symmetrical. It's incredibly organized and where they're dancing is actually following very geometrical patterns. So the, the fails very much as it's, again, the juxtapositions not, or you know the opposite of the curpites in terms of how they're dancing. So after the dance competition, right, which is done between the Barrio de Arriba and the Barrio de Abajo, it's hardcore rivalry. It's so much fun uh, uh, to see. And my, you know, my host family, we're from the Barrio de Abajo. 
So, so it's, it gets, you know, there's a lot of tension and drama. Uh, so, but after this is done, part of, uh, and, uh, and what a lot of people are very much interested in and why so many young men actually participate in the curpites at least once in their life is that the curpites then actually have to go dancing to all the girlfriends, uh, um, so all the girlfriends' houses. So if you have 200 purpitas dancing, you're going to go to dance to 200 houses. So after the competition ends at the evening of the second, they start dancing and going by house to house. Uh, each uh, group needs to have their own band. So it's with live music. It's not a radio or anything or a boombox. It's, a, you know, live music. And then they go dancing. And whenever they go to uh, someone's house, right? The person that organized that house or for that house has to have sacks of oranges, uh, so fruits of the season, gifts, every you know anything that they want to give to that person, and then, and the majority of the cases they don't let them into the house to dance, so they normally dance in the street. So that year in 2010, um, although Cheyo was the one that was dancing, but he was single. Pancho had a girlfriend, so we needed to go take gifts to Pancho's house. So basically, we spend all January 8th because they start on January 7th and then the whole day of January 8th until they are done. It doesn't mean it finish. It doesn't matter if they finish by midnight, they continue dancing so that we were following the curpites until they finish. And it took like forever until they got to Pancho's girlfriend's house for us to be able to get and give them the sacks of oranges and all that stuff. And in the meantime, groups of curpites have actually gone to my host family's house to bring uh, gifts for one of my whole sisters and we missed it uh, because we were following the curpites, right? So and that is how I connected with uh, courtship rituals, right? It's part of this very complex different systems in which there's exchange of gifts between young people, right? And, and who is performing from who and all that stuff. But as I mentioned, I'm interested in presenting especially how the curpites and dances like this have become space, really important spaces for resistance. So as I briefly mentioned at the beginning, the Michoacan unfortunately has been um, suffering and specifically also indigenous communities have been specifically targeted for uh, the violence or, you know, they've been receiving so much violence because of the war on drug that started in 2006, state repression, especially during the the ruling of of, um, ah, of Silvano, so our previous, not our current governor, but the previous one, who's during his uh, tenure as governor, the violence in indigenous communities skyrocketed, both from narco groups and state repression. Um, uh, Dr. Gabriela Spiros Rico has published on this, uh, one of her pieces on the hashtags and, and the level of violence that indigenous communities has suffered. So it's, it's one of the pieces that, that, you know, really illustrates this level of violence and specifically also how indigenous communities have been pushing back, right? So to give you an idea, it's in these moments of heightened violence where dances and events and rituals and performances acquire even stronger meaning and significance. So in actually in 2020, so in January uh, 2020, when the community is celebrating the Curpites, and it was actually the day that the Curpites are going throughout the whole community, there was a shootout between narco cells. So because narco cells have been taking over abandoned houses in Angawan. Um, and so, so the state police then came over to get these narco cells. So the shootout actually ensued when you had actually all these young people in the streets dancing and celebrating in Angawan. So the during this, actually, it was chaos in the community. I was not there. I, I heard all the reports afterwards uh, from friends and relatives. Um, so, you know, they stopped the dancing, obviously, for a couple of hours until everything calmed down. Nobody was actually hurt, fortunately, uh, during the shootout. But, you know, it was a very heightened moment. And after everything was calm and all that stuff, they continued dancing, right? And they finished the, the, the rituals and the events of the curpites for that day. And even during the pandemic, actually, even with restrictions, a lot of events actually continue happening as um, Pavel was showing in terms of Tokoro, right? So how the pastorelas and other events actually continue happening and how important it was to be able to do and celebrate in the, in the midst of this level of violence. 
because of the violence also, something that has happened in starting in 2011 is that communities such as Ch the community of Cheran have risen up in arms and to kick out the government and uh, in the narco cells. And because of that, actually, much mo many more other Purepecha and other indigenous communities in Michoacán have been fighting for their autonomy and to be able to have their own representation and to be able to organize themselves based on the ideas of el costumbre. So Anangawan, in 2021, then they voted in favor of the autonomy from the, the regional municipal government, which is the city of Uruapan. So since 2021, Angawan has been autonomous. And with that, they've been then organizing themselves and curating their own cultural practices for them and the ways that they want to do it, not necessarily following the requirements of the city of Uruapan. So part of this then has become that their events have become much more, you know, they've become bigger, much more elaborate, but again, it's all also for them. So here, this is an example that then in 2021, 2022, the organizers of cultural events and specifically the Kurpita competition um, organized or requested the, ma the making of these monumental masks to decorate actually the stage for the competition, the Purepecha competition. So there's been very much um, uh this this movement to really think about how people in the community or how they are curating their own cultural practices, how they are preserving. So they're doing a lot of teaching, of organizing in the community to preserve different cultural practices such as the curpites and to specifically get the younger generation into dancing, right? And to participating as a way of resisting this level of violence and an encroachment and continued, basically continued violence from stemming from colonialism, right? So that narco and state violence is, it's, it, it's continuing following this level of violence that stems from colonialism and that communities have been resisting now for over 500 years. So here again, we see the importance of these dances, how they're very, very much alive and continue again, providing, um, um, these structures for people in the community to want to make these dances relevant for them, right? They're telling their own stories and the way that they wanna tell them. And so that culture, right, is very much alive and relevant to and for future generations. So thank you. That is, was uh, what I wanted to uh, share with all of you today. Uh, so I'll stop sharing. I, I, it was an offshoot of what I presented and I talked about it in, in my piece, but. In any case, thank you so much, Gabby, for the invitation. Thank you so much, Mincy. I think we're all so excited about your manuscript and, and your book. <clears throat> Next, we, I want to welcome Dr. Luis Urieta, Jr., who is a professor of cultural studies and education. He is affiliated at the University of Texas, Austin. He is affiliated in the Center for, Central, for Mexican American Studies the Native American and Indigenous Studies Program, and the Lozano Long Benson Institute of Latin American Studies. Dr. Urrieta's research interests are cultural and racial identities, agency as social and cultural practices, collective action related to education and learning in family and community contexts. He has been a resident scholar at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a Fulbright Garcia Robles Fellow in Mexico, a Fellow of the American Educational Research Association, the Spencer Foundation, and the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education. Dr. Urieta held the Lee H. Jamail Regents Chair in Education from 2006 to 2008 and currently holds the Suzanne B. and John L. Adams Professorship in Education. In 2012, he was honored with the Alumni Achievement Award from the School of Education at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And in 2014, he was named a Cesar Chavez Champion of Change by the Obama White House, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> Dr. Rieta is the author of the award-winning book, Working From Within, Chicana and Chicano Activist Educators in White Stream Schools, in addition to an extensive publishing record. One recent book is the co-edited volume titled Cultural Constructions of Identity, Metaethnography, and Theory. Dr. Urrieta's presentation is titled Mascaras de Diablo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for organizing this event. Uh, I want to express my gratitude also to the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies 
uh, the Department of American Indian Studies and the Department of Anthropology at the University of Minnesota for their uh, co-sponsorship. And to, to Pavel, Dr. Schlossberg for uh, really igniting this uh, work around uh, mascaras and, and danzas and uh, you know the, the trajectory that he's built on on that. So uh, and then to my dear colleagues Mitzi uh, and Mario, uh, so glad that y'all are part of this project as well. And um, I want to start by uh, prefacing that my presentation is more of a, a reflection and a homage uh, to my late uncle Juan Norta Castillo from Tocuaro, Michoacán, and also to my mother. Uh, Elodia Ramos Horta to the community of Tocuaro, the mass makers of Tocuaro. And I also want to honor um, our ancestors and the stewards of the lands on which I live and work, the Alabama Cushara, Carrizo, Come Crudo, Comanche, Kikapu, Lipan, Apache, Tancawa, and the uh, Tiwa Pueblo, and all of the past uh, native and indigenous peoples and current indigenous peoples that live on what we call today Texas or Texas. Not an easy place to live nowadays. <laughs> um, and so the title of this presentation is Mascaras de Diablo. And uh, let me show my PowerPoint. Okay, so. Um, on February 20th, 1958, Gavino Ramos Estrada finalized a transaction in which he sold historical documents, the Titolo Primordial from his community of Tocuaro, to representatives from the Mexican National Museum of Anthropology for the amount of 250 pesos. The original primordial document written in Purepecha documents the foundation, village boundaries, land, as well as the journeys and lineages of several Tarascan kings in the Lake Pátzcuaro area. Gabino Ramos Estrada was my mother's paternal uncle, and up until I found out, found the publication uh, written by Roskamp and Monzón in 2020, which documents the sale of the Titulo Primordial, my mother had no idea that this event had ever happened. My mother remembers her tío Gabino as a very humble man, uh, together, we wondered why he might have had this centuries-old document in his possession and why he sold it. Perhaps he sold the Pueblo's patrimony because he needed money or because he was not fully aware of the Titolo's value to the community. Whatever his reasoning, the Titolo Primordial de Tocuaro is now archived with other codices in the National Library of the Anthropology and History Museum in Mexico City, documenting the Purepecha origins of this community. I preface this contribution uh, with the story of Pio Gavino because although my intention is to honor my late uncle Juan uh, Orta Castillo and the mass makers of Tocuaro, it is important to situate this pueblo within a broader and longer genealogy, a millennial and indigenous gene genealogy that honors the nearby waters, ancestors, and land that this community sits on today. For over a decade, my research has focused on my father's pueblo of San Miguel Nocosepo. But with this work, I honor my mother, as I already mentioned, and her pueblo, San Andres Tocoro. I also honor our ancestors, as I mentioned as well. According to my mother, men have made masks in Tocoro for as long as she can remember. Some made, made, made masks uh, exclusively for the pastorela, which was mentioned earlier uh, by Pavel and uh, Mincing in Tocuaro, which is celebrated as a five-day fiesta that begins on February 2nd in honor of La Virgen de la Candelaria. Over time, and here's an image, <clears throat> over time, men began to make a living out of making masks, uh, and others only made them on, when commissioned or when they were not working on their milpas. <clears throat> My grandfather, Juan Ramos Estrada, uh, brother of Gabino Ramos Estrada, shared with me that when he was an adolescent, uh, that uh, when I was an adolescent, that El Rey Cazonzin or El Rey Tarasco had given each pueblo in the basin their specialized labor. Tocuaro specialized in woodwork, including mass making. Uh, through time, this pueblo has become known for its craft, 
Another explanation for the Pueblo specialization in woodwork is that the Pueblo also does not have a large land base for crop, crop cultivation. A smaller land base in part is due to the lake's fluctuating levels, which came up to the town's edge in different epochs, but also because the Pueblo largely rejected agrarismo, the agrarian reform in the post-revolutionary period and remained firmly Catholic and conservative during the Cristiada. So this community does not have a Hilo lands actually. Tocuaro's recognition for mask making is documented in the um, Centro Regional de Educación Fundamental para América Latina, or El Crefal. The Crefal was established as a headquarters in Pátzcuaro, Michoacán, in 1951, and implemented fundamental education projects in the surrounding pueblos, including Tocuaro. Halford indicates that the UNESCO's fundamental education programs were all about human betterment conceived in economic as well as social, political, and personal terms. Although they often framed local community practices in deficiency in order to promote modernist national consciousness, in Tocuaro the Crefal archive features Jose Maria Ponce, who you see here on this slide, a renowned mask maker uh, in, during this time and now. Um, and I found these, it's interesting, I found these images just by chance when I went to visit the archive at the Crefal. Uh, I was really looking for material about my father's hometown, Nocutsepo, but I, I came across a lot of material on Tocuaro, and surprisingly, uh, not as much about Nocutsepo. So here are other uh, images of Jose Maria Ponce, and here's another image of a Crefal member purchasing some masks from him. And actually, the lady in the background here is my partner's, um, uh, her tia abuela, her this lady, um, Soledad, and her grandmother, uh, Angelina, were sisters. So they she married into Tocuaro. Uh, so through Crefal, though Crefal's focus on local economies, uh, development, and simultaneous promotion of tourism as an industry, especially in Michoacán, mask making increased in Tocuaro. The folklorization of dances like Los Viejitos and its dissemination as an icon of Mexican nationalism also increase the demand for particular types of performances uh, that require masks. Okay, who am I kidding? I need glasses. <laughs> I have to come to terms with my age. Uh, <laughs> uh, demand for masks. Um, Martinez Ayala notes that by 1971, every family in Tocuaro was involved in artisanry of some sort, largely mask making and textile embroidery. Well, 30 years earlier, there were only four to five mask makers in the Pueblo. Tocuaro artists increasingly sold their masks in regional, state, and national markets as they became renowned uh, for their award-winning participation in artesanía contests, which uh, Dr. Schlossberg uh, captures very well in his book. I grew up hearing about the Pastorela Danza in Tocuaro from my mother, who often recalled her childhood and youth in the Pueblo. For my family members in Tocuaro, I heard about the growing number of national and international tourists that landed on the Pueblo yearly to photograph and film the danza, and as time passed, increasingly to buy masks as they toured the region, especially during Dia de los Muertos celebrations, which Dr. Spears Rico captures very well in her work as well. Tocuaro eventually became an important stop on most regional, national, and international tourist guides, and there's even a Tocuaro and Mexican village curriculum uh, that was developed in the United Kingdom and that includes uh, mask coloring uh, pages. Unfortunately, in the last decade, the increased uh, violence uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, Martinez mentions uh, brought on by narco cartels and the state's war on organized crime has dealt a huge blow on the tourist industry in the region and mask making has decreased considerably. Increased access to higher education and professional careers as well as out migration has also shifted uh, people's interest away from craft making as a sustained economic interest. There's a, there's actually a lot of uh, professionals in Tocuaro uh, because of the lack of land base, um, this declining interest in craft making. Um, there's a, like lots of lawyers, uh, teachers, medical doctors. It's a very interesting, a very interesting community. Uh, <clears throat> I grew up with uh, many different wooden masks hanging on our walls in my parents' house in California. The masks were beautifully painted, glossy, and shined in the sunlight. They often represented men known as Los Viejos and my father's Pueblo of Nocutsepo, and Los Negritos and my mother's Pueblo of Tocuaro. 
I rarely saw any masks of women, but we did have one with bright red lips that even and even had long earrings. And I didn't know that this was actually a um, Maringia mask until I came across Mario's work. And so uh, I'm very grateful for knowing more about that. So other masks represented half human, half animal beings like lizards or fish with human faces. Most of the masks had holes in the eye sockets that sometimes were scary, a silent and maybe even reproachful reminder that they were meant to be worn. Uh, the devil mask made, my, made by my Tio Juan here in this photograph uh, uh, represents uh, some of that uh, for me. So that's why I included it here and I have that quote there. Each time we visited Tokuaro, my Tio Juan uh, would gift us a new mask that would eventually take its place on our wall back home in California. The masks became part of our lives, watching us, reminding us of where we came from, of where we were from. All of the masks were beautiful, but the most majestic were the grand devil masks, La Mascara del Diablo, with long twisted horns, long tongues, and sometimes partially covered with lizards and snakes like you can see here. The devil's masks were nearly always black, a few were red, but always intriguing, reflecting the dreams and imagination that they created, that they were created from. Uh, my uncle was born in Tocuaro on November 2nd, 1940. According to my tia Nedina, my mom's sister, his widow, <clears throat> uh, he was orphaned at a young age and learned how to make masks as an adolescent in order to be able to participate in the danza as a negrito. He learned in a rudimentary style that was a flat, unfinished mask uh, that is still made, actually, and was common at that time, made from softwood known as copalillo. He quickly realized that he liked woodworking and had a talent for it. He began making images of saints and, and animals and eventually settled on mask making. Early on in their marriage, my tia recalls that he used natural dyes for his masks from flowers, uh, from soot and from other natural materials. Over time, he developed and perfected techniques like polishing and painted finishes that would win him regional, national, and international recognition as he entered and won artisan competitions. He was the first prize winner of Mexico's National Mask Maker Competition, and his mask is currently included in the permanent collection of El Museo de la Mascara in San Luis Potosí, Mexico. As his fame spread, he was invited to various art institutes, museums, cultural centers, universities, and schools throughout Mexico and the United States, where his masks were exhibited and remain housed in permanent collections, such as the School of Art in Chicago, the Field Museum of Natural History, the Anaheim Museum, and, and an exhibit that uh, Dr. Schlossberg hel helped him uh, put together in uh, the Anaheim Museum that I was uh, very happy to be there for with my family. Uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, the Folk Art Museum of Central Texas, and Brown University. His masks were also featured in Ballet Folklorico de Mexico performances throughout Mexico and, and throughout the world. Even though he gained national and international acclaim, Tio Juan always remained humble. A visit to a school with small children was just as important to him as a visit to an Ivy League university. Through these visits, he adjusted to his audience and tried to connect as authentically as possible. Tio Juan had a positive attitude toward life with a good sense of humor and relational connections to the human and non-human worlds. He often talked about the importance of his dreams as messages that influenced his art and his craft, as well as the ways the wood itself guided his imagination and vision of the mask it wanted to become. Most importantly, he was a man devoted to his family and to his pueblo. He served his community in various civic and religious, social and leadership roles, including several times as a carguero, one of the highest and most demanding year-long communal services in the pueblo. He served as a padrino to countless people, myself included, and he taught his five sons and others in the community the art of his trade. His legacy lives on in his work, the work that he loved and was very proud of, and the work that he continues to do until his last days. I conclude by recalling the Titulo Primordial de Tocuaro and what it represents for the millennial history of the Pueblo and the art and craft of mask making as an ancestral, but also ever-changing practice. For me, learning of the Titulo situates Tocuaro in a Purepecha genealogy on indigenous lands and waters and mask making, as my mother says, for as long as anyone can remember as an indigenous art. However, 
I also recognize that Tio Juan led, a way, led the way for the mass makers of his generation through tradition, but also through innovation and change with new techniques in different places for different audiences. His legacy and his work reflect the dynamic process of life and also the dynamic process of what indigeneity means, right? It's not static. A life, um, a life he lived in the most optimistic and positive ways. So um, the only thing I can add to that is just that this work has really opened a lot of uh, reflection for me in terms of like, you know, what is indigeneity? What do we think of as indigeneity? Um, how life continues, how uh, indigeneity is dynamic, innovative, and uh, it's not static, right? Uh, and it disrupts a lot of like the, the romanticized ways that we think of indigeneity uh, so often. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Luis. That was just wonderful and so moving to hear. And I have a follow-up question, but I'll ask it during the Q&A. <laughs> um, and then I would I would now like to welcome doctoral candidate Mario Alberto Gomez Zamora, who is a first-generation Purepecha migrant queer scholar from Tangancícuaro, a small town in Michoacán, Mexico. Currently, he is a PhD candidate in Latin American and Latino Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He holds a bachelor's degree in secondary education with concentration in history from Normal, Normal Superior Juana de Asbaje and a master's degree in education and history from Universidad Michoacana de San Nicolás de Hidalgo. His research interests include local history, oral tradition, indigenous memory, two-spirit studies, and transnational Purepecha culture. His research has been published in Genealogy Journal, Special Issue on Native Indigenous Family Studies in the Americas, and I think that one's actually forthcoming, and in Revista Diarios de Terruño, Reflexiones sobre Migración y Movilidad. His current work examines sexuality and gender identity among the Purepecha community in Michoacán and in the United States. As a graduate student, he received the competitive five-year Eugene Cotarrobles Fellowship. He was also a fellow with the Crossing Latinidades Initiative of the Mellon Foundation. And Mario's uh, doctor candidate, Mario Gomez Zamora's presentation today is titled Queerness and Maringuía Danzantes in Purepecha Communities in Michoacán. Great. Muchas gracias, Gabi. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation for, you know, holding this space. I always call you like my madrina, Dr. Spears Rico. So it's an honor to be here with all of you, with Luis, Pavel, and Mincy. Um, this morning when I was leaving, my partner was asking me, are you nervous? And of course, there is always a level of, of adrenaline, but I told him, well, I will be with family, so I think I will be okay. Um, so yeah, and thank you also to the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center for the invitation and for having me here. Uh, I want to acknowledge also the land where I am right now, which is in Santa Cruz, California. But I also want to, you know, especially today that we are celebrating um, Dia de las Comunidades Indígenas. Um, the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Aguawas speaking Wipi tribe, the Mamutsu tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to the mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during the Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. It's today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. So yeah, today I will be talking about queerness and Maringuilla danzantes in Purepecha communities. This is part of my doctoral dissertation and this chapter of my dissertation, I think will be the third chapter, it became kind of like the spine of my research. I think since we presented in Eri back in October, I started to realize I wanted to study gender performance and particularly the Maringuilla, but also uh, other Purepecha people who we not necessarily find a place in these gender binary traditions. And many times we um, tend to perform in a way that disrupt the traditions. So I think the Maringuilla, is a key character as a character, because of course I want to also honor the real identities of the people, but as a character is causing some disruption, but also claiming a space for queer people. Uh, for this presentation, I only focus in Michoacán. However, my research also is in the US, particularly in the Chicago suburbs area, uh, Portland, Oregon, 
North and um, so South and North California. So I cannot talk about everything today, but I will focus uh, in this particular part. So let me share my screen. Well, I need to share screen first, right? Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, that day is their day. Those who are like that, that they wear heels better than me as a woman. And that day, those, those who perform like Maniguilla dance here in the community with their very short skirts. These are some phrases Purepecha leaders from the four regions in Michoacán used to refer to the character of the Maringuilla, a female character, danzante or performer, and other people from the LGBTQ plus community. When I started my doctoral field work in Michoacán in September 2022, I didn't know how to introduce my research topic to community leaders. I was anxious about homophobic responses and rejections to my persona. Since I had previously worked in some communities in the region while completing my master's degree, some locals knew me, knew I was a public teacher who also liked to collect oral histories. Like other regions in Mexico, teachers are socially recognized in Purepecha Pueblos. People tend to respect their voice, even if the teacher is originally from another, commu another community. However, this time I addressed a topic that could make the community feel uncomfortable. As a local ethnographer, Asking locals for an interview made me feel insecure because I positioned myself to my interlocutors as a queer individual most of the times. I was clear to my interviewees that this time I, want, I wanted to research the stories the community doesn't know, openly discuss, or doesn't open, openly talk. Or if they do it, it's when a certain level of stigma because those stories refer to the queer population or the gender binary disruption. On the first occasion, I presented the theme of my investigation Locals introduce me to contact or suggest they suggest me to contact those who are like that. And I want to emphasize that because that was the sentence or the way how they refer to queer or LGBTQ plus communities. And who perf often perform like Maringuillas, it seemed this character was their main collective reference of a queer individual. In Purepecha context, Maringuillas tend to be represented by the gay queer community but there are exceptions where women also participate as Maringuillas. And I think um, that happens sometimes in Patamban and other communities in the, in the mountains region. And I realize it also that happens in communities in the Sacramento in California. Uh, so although in some cases, women also participate as a character like the case of Patamban in Michoacán and Purepecha communities in Sacramento. Traditionally, the Maringuilla performs in Catholic an indigenous celebration as a representation of the Virgin or Virgen Maria, or as a counterpart of men who perform as a male danzante, that means he already mentioned in several of these like characters or performers. Like is the case of the traditional dance of los viejitos or the curpites from Calzones in Michoacán or Angawan as well. Usually the Maringuilla wear female purepecha clothes, and I would say wing quotation marks because you know female could have many interpretations but according to the community. Um, such as guanengos, shirts, an agua, and a sturdy skirt tied to their hips with a fajo, a traditional man mandil, apron, a colorful colors, high heels, that's very important, the high heels, and a mask decorated with red lipstick and blush. This mask in particular that we have in the photo, I don't think it was from Michoacán, the Maringuilla that day was wearing a mask from Chiapas, if I remember correctly. But I decided to keep this mask since he's a person I kind of like follow for through different like towns, communities, following their performances. So you can see how beautiful is the mask, how try to they, they, try, they try to decorate the mask. But I think the most important thing here is that it helps them to hide who they are, their identities. Um, here is a photo in Sopoco, Michoacán, where the Maringuilla allowed me to go into their private space when they were getting ready to dance. So they were getting, you know, dressed. So I was able to even help them to get dressed and to see how they were like transforming into the character. And I will not go into too much of these details because I want to focus more on what this means, you know, the dance and the performing, what it means for the gender disruption. But here is the Maringuilla almost ready, used to put the hat and the trenzas 
and just leave the 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 house and dance in the plaza with other dancers. Under Purepecha, uh, son ese abajeños, Maringillas dance in the public space by themselves with heterosexual men and other members of the community. Unlike other Maringillas, Patamban Maringillas don't wear the same artifacts, which is different. For example, they don't wear the traditional dress. Instead, they wear short skirts and modern clothes. However, they used to dance with heterosexual men who perform as veos or viejos, as we saw. These characters tend to be common in many of the, of the traditions. Who, whose masks tend to represent a parody, a parodia of politicians, clowns, and ugly monsters. Notably, as I moved across different Purepecha communities, I recognized that the Maringilla was not the only representation of those who are like that, as local leaders indicated me many times. I learned, I learned about the complexities of Maringillas beyond the ceremonies and other queer individuals who navigate gender binary rituals and customs in the daily life within their communities. The Maringillas doesn't represent a drag performer, I want to clarify that, or a third gender person, like is the case of Muches and Visas, Visa and indigenous communities in Oaxaca, and that North American anthropologist Lynn Stephen studied in the 1980s and 90s. In the collective memory of the Purepecha communities, those who are like that refers to individuals whose gender performance contradicts what the community expects from them as cisgender women or men and who many times are named by the collective with derogatory terms. Also, those who are like that, who often perform feminine behaviors with quotes, are a counter mirror to normal men also with quotes because it's how people, we say, oh, because those men are normal or they don't have the capacity to move their bodies <clears throat> like that. How people refer to heterosexual men and masculine men who are perceived with a lack of dance skills. A Purepecha leader from Nichan, Michoacán, in the Cañada region, explaining her, explaining her community has different terms to name those people who perform beyond the margins of heteronormativity. For example, she said, women who andan, who perform, as men are called nana, nana tataka, and men who andan like women are called, are, are, are llamados tatak nanaka. So they kind of like switch the terms for tata, nana, and, and, and tatas. The terms allude to the ways individuals perform their genders, which is tied to gender binary constructions. An elder female from Patamba shared that a woman who is tough or aggressive and who doesn't wear feminine clothes and who even cuts her hair short would be read as a marimacha, a lesbian, while a woman who is soft and delicate and who moves his heels and body while walking is read as a gay or homosexual. These narratives are not necessarily linked to sexual orientations but instead they respond to local logics of gender roles and traditional customs the Purepecha community follows. Yeah. The Purepecha researcher and native speaker, uh, Maruk Lucas Hernandez, through the oral tradition indicated his community, Santa Fe La Laguna, there is a Purepecha term to refer to queer people or feminine men. Lucas Hernandez indicated that in his community, when a line is not either bitter or sweet, they call it charita, which indicates the fruit is in a medium point, como in between and no dulce ni agria. Indeed, there are Purepecha terms to name queer people, which also reflect the Purepecha cosmogony going beyond the gender binary spectrum and heteronormativity. However, it is important to put in conversation these Purepecha terms when gender binary ideas imposed through colon to Spanish col colonization in Michoacán, which complicates the Purepecha epistemologies of gender and sexuality, affecting the, way affecting the ways um, how we perceive the per performativity of the bodies in the local space. Regarding the Maringilla Danzante, the community seemed to find a better representation of this character by queer individuals since they embody with more fluence the female performativity. However, there is no limitation for heterosexual men to participate as Maringillas in festival in, his community, in their communities. This is the case of Julio Zaragoza, a 50-year-old man one, um, covering their real identity, who reside in East LA and who yearly returned to Paracho, Michoacán, to dance as Maringilla in the traditional fair of La Guitarra. He clarified in his pueblo, the man is el que se viste de Maringilla, who dresses as a woman. Above all is the environment and have fun. Have a nice moment, representing how we wear a mask and how we wear a very pronounced breast. And he started laughing. The environment is healthy, the tradition is to have fun, and above everything, the Maringilla is the stellar, es el estelar de la, de, de la party. 
beforehand, everyone knows the Maringilla, the Maringillas are men, and that's the tradition. Julio has danced as Maringilla for over 30 years, three decades. And he tried to return every August to his pueblo to represent the character. He emphasized that without the Maringillas mask, he will not be able to echar relajo, to be noisy and loud. With freedom, he enjoyed the opportunity of being the center of attention of the party, and he liked it when people ask them, ask him for a photo, particularly when Mary tells herself and men ask him for a photo. He mentioned that he enjoyed surprising his compadres and friends by rubbing his big breasts on their shoulders. The Mexican scholar Lorena Heda Davila stated that the recreation, uh, I, I quote, of festivals and ceremonies in the indigenous communities had diverse implications and functions. Firstly, firstly, in the sociocultural ambit, but also economically and politically. Ojeda Davila invoked different scholarship to reflect about the possibilities the festivals open as a democratic space where the, quote, the utopia of equality, and I end the quote, takes place. Julio's situation reflected many of these possibilities, where not only the collective ones permit themselves to recreate an utopic life within the celebration, but the effects also relapse at the individual level. Julio can allow himself to be someone he cannot, he cannot be the rest of the year in the Pueblo. In a way, the festivals allow the consensus eruption of the rituals and customs of Purepecha communities. <clears throat> Purepecha leaders in the mountain region said that since the early 2000s, they noticed more gay or feminine men occupying the Maringilla role since they seem to have better dancing skills than a normal man. And sometimes, and this I didn't put it here, but many times they also get hired to compete in the dances because they had more chances to, you know, to win. Following the word of Jacinto Zavala about the foundation of the costumbre in Purepecha community of Cheran, the scholar affirmed that since before a child arrives at the world, the community, quote, socially counts with the child, child, and they have community expectations, and end the quote, for the newborn. But on some occasions, there are individuals who don't fall into the gender binary expectation and whose body performativity exceeds the limits of what the community understands as the balance of the costumbre. In this sociocultural phenomenon, there are tensions, contradictions, and fluency. There is no a strict agenda to understand the gender binary construction, which Julio reflected when he clarified he was no gay, but he liked the relajo, which he expressed through his female performances. There is no an itinerary to address how this gender binary phenomena happen because this Purepecha locality navigates the costumbre in their own terms and necessities. As I also indicated for the case of Patamban, and Northern California communities. It's significant to highlight the reference to those who are like that, understanding the term was crucial for the path my research took after my first encounters with locals. In many of my interviews, of my interviews and oral history recollections, Purepecha elders signaled, or signaled those who are like that participate as Maringilla in the danzas of their pueblo. I think I need to move to the, another slide. Regarding Maringillas, locals indicate, indicated they have their season, which usually is through December and February, which is the harvest season, you know, and the communities are getting ready for the new uh, siembra del maíz and the new season of the raining, uh, the raining season. Uh, because they tend to dance during the harvest season, which in many pueblos last from December to February, overlapping with multiple Catholic celebrations and ending with the local carnivals in February. When talking to Maringillas, one of the Purepecha leaders from Patamban shared they have better skills to move their bodies than a normal man. Community organizers choose them to compete in dances because they have more opportunities to win in local competitions. Also, Sebastián Galindo Vallejo, a leader originally from the Pueblo Charapan and a public teacher in Colegio Bachilleros del Estado de Michoacán in Ocumicho, so the community I have here in the forum, indicated in our encounter. And I quote Sebastiana Galindo. Usually these communities, the LGBTQ plus community, participate in these activities that are limited to machitos, referring to hyper-masculine behaviors. For example, many men feel shame to make alboroto, to be noise, noisy, to get attention. In that sense, this community use it for these purposes by locals. Since they, since they are very bold, people situate them, and the community asks them to perform activities that others, men, cannot perform because they feel shame or worry about what people would think. These people are braver when they have become open about who they are. So that's Sebastián Galindo's quote. 
The reflections of Galindo and other community members helped me illuminate my argument about how gender binary is performative and fluent in various directions in the communities, which in a manner allows queer communities to join some aspects of the traditions. Thus, it doesn't mean that the queer poor epic individuals ca can participate in all, in all aspects of the tradition of the poor epic community. But if the collective can assign a role or a commission for queer individuals within the margins of the local binarism, queer people can practice some of the rituals and customs. According to the oral history I collected with local leader Jose Bilbao Lucas Medina, the community of Santa Fe La Laguna in the Lake region, they are gay men devoted to be maringuillas for the local festivals, who will respect the local cargueros as maringuillas to participate during the holidays. The cargueros bring a gift to the maringuilla to formalize a petition. Usually they bring a bottle of tequila. Invoking the Purepeche historian Cortez, Juan Carlos Cortez Máximo, in Santa Fe La Laguna, Los Tarian Paquiticha, that are like Los Reyes Magos during the Niño Dios celebrations in January, were accompanied by a woman with a rebozo where she hid her face and she also wore a man hat on her head. Some years ago, this woman was called Mari Cucata, the one who wears like the virgin. But in fact, it wasn't a woman, it was a man wearing like a woman who dances with Natari and Paquitica. So this could also explain why the Maringia is represented with a mask with white skin, because it represents the Virgin Maria, who arrived as a part of the European colonization. As I traveled across Purepecha communities, I realized that locals asked me to talk to Maringuillas since they were often more open about their sexuality and gender expressions. And it was easier for me to contact them, comparing to those queer individuals who were more reserved when, the, when manifesting their identities or who probably performed masculine or feminine or femininity aligned with the community expectations. <clears throat> I argue that the gender binary construction, flu construction fluctuates according to the local necessities and the services queer, pure, queer pure pecha people can offer to the collective which in, in a way allows them to be part of the costumbre and the maraspeni. The maraspeni is a servicio to the community in reciprocity with others, according to Cortez Maximo. Although in many of these practices fall into heteronormative categories with roles that correspond to male, female, gender binary. The queer pure pecha community is not necessarily isolated in many of these rituals and traditions, which allow many of them to offer servicio to the community and to be part of the costumbre. By this, I don't, I don't try to essentialize the homophobic attacks, anti-gay violence, and discrimination many queer purepecha expressed have experienced we in their communities or outside their communities. Indeed, my intention is to understand the complex la landscape of gender binary performance, performances which regulates the life of purepecha communities. And almost to end, in this photo, I remember when the Maringuilla in Okumicho took the mask off, I remember a child asking, oh, it's a señor, right? Like this is also how the community is perceiving them. And many times also, they believe the Maringuilla has more capacity than a normal women to dance through the whole day. So there are a lot of like gender constructions around the character and that things that they hold in their bodies. Queer Purepecha people don't necessarily exist beyond the sociocultural margins of their communities, but when their gender performativity challenge the social expectation and gender binary characteristics is when they face cultural tensions, homophobia, and in some cases, physical violence. My hope is that those who are like that, as locals refer to them, can have a dignified recognition within their communities and that they can continue collaborating with a named identity into the fluent practice of Purepecha traditions in Michoacán and the US too, as part of my bro broader project. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, we are pretty short on time. Um, I don't think we have a, any uh, time necessarily for questions, perhaps just one question. If somebody has a burning thought or question out there that they want to ask um, to our wonderful panelists. I had a I had a question um, that maybe a couple of you might could touch on, you know, um, briefly, which is just what is this work meant to your families? 
Um, for those of you who worked, you know, in the region and, and have family there, um, I just, I haven't really heard my, you know, colegas here talk about, talk about that. Um, but some of you are doing very personal, you know, um, work there. So I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on that before we wrap up here. Well, my family is actually joining us. They're they're in the audience from Pátzcuaro, so so they joined us. So they're somewhere in there in the in the ether, uh, and and it's you know it very quickly right. It's been very beautiful actually. So my family they go with me to Angawan and they have engaged and they are in a reciprocal relationship with my host family. So um, uh, so so it's it's been very much a family affair for me with my siblings and my parents and my uncles and aunts over there in Mexico and, and going. So so even if I'm at presentation right now, I didn't go into that. Uh, but it's been like really exciting um, to to share this with with my family and to start writing about this. And and especially, for example, some of my cousins are like they they tell me every so often they're like, we're so happy that you're writing about this and that you care about these stories, which, you know, uh, helps to continue doing this work because sometimes it's not very easy or, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard um, sometimes, but having the family there, it's really cool. And, you know, so, and having them, you know, joining us from Pat Squad is actually also really cool. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, with that, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank everybody for joining us um, and spending part of your Indigenous Peoples Day with us here. I also want to mention that my work on my community of Chato is also um, included in the book. You have to buy it to be able to hear my <laughs> presentation. <laughs> So that will be the one that the big mystery one that you can um, pick up when you when you actually purchase the book. Um, I want to thank my dear colegas um, for joining us uh, today and uh, for accepting this um, invitation. The Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, I want to um, thank um, Dakota Lambs where where we um, held the uh, hosted the presentation from at the University of Minnesota and here where I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and. I'll also, thank you to my Spears family that, you know, showed up also in strong force here um, to support the event. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Until the end.